So what does the argument of the Tenth Federalist say? The Tenth Federalist is Madison's effort to understand one of the most basic problems of political life and one that the Constitution seeks a unique solution to, and that is the problem of faction. Uh, if you recall, uh, uh, the revolutionary era was very concerned about political virtue. They wrote it into their constitutions. They had come to realize by 1787, 88, that if you put all of your faith in virtue, you were likely to be disappointed. Because the idea that any political body could consistently act in a virtuous manner is simply not realistic given human nature. So Madison, looking over the history of ancient republics, looking over the recent history of America says, is there any way we can artificially or creatively come up with a solution to deal with faction? Because in essence, what is corruption? Corruption happens when people put a narrow interest ahead of what's good for, the, uh, for, for their society. Corruption happens when people manipulate the system to benefit themselves at the expense of others. Madison comes to believe that uh, many, many political philosophers, going back to the great ancient philosophers, going back to Aristotle, uh, uh, through the Renaissance philosophers, uh, through the great English philosophers of the 17th century, Locke and Harrington and Sidney, they have all failed to, uh, to grasp an essential point of politics, which is, you must build political solutions around the real nature of humanity, not around some idealized hope about humanity. Um, and Madison uh, recognizes the one thing that you can count on in most circumstances is that people will follow their self-interest. Now, if people follow their self-interest in a kind of everyone is out for themselves, that's anarchy. Uh, that will not result in a good outcome particularly when uh, there are unequal uh, resources available. So for instance, Madison is particularly worried about that majorities will oppress minorities, that they will sacrifice the interests of either religious minorities uh, and oppress them, or uh, property holders uh, who are a smaller group, uh, at least large property holders are a smaller group than than, than uh, average property holders, uh, he's worried that perhaps you know, they will get together and oppress uh, through these pro-debtor kinds of legislation uh, creditors. So um, he recognizes that that is a dynamic in politics and that leads to conflict, that leads to corruption, and ultimately that can, that can uh, be uh, the downfall of, of a republic. So his insight is how do we make interest work for us instead of against us? And theorists going back to, to uh, throughout the Western tradition have thought that a Republican government will only work if the Republic is small and everyone has the same interest. So a small agrarian Republic where people are ethnically, racially, religiously homogeneous. That's the only way that you can have a Republican government because everyone is basically very similar. They won't fight uh, incessantly over over how to allocate resources, they won't fight over religion, uh, they won't fight over which sector of the economy needs to benefit because they're all farmers. Madison says that's mistaken. And you have to think about this for a moment because it, in a way it's breathtaking. Madison, after studying ancient history and looking at the recent history of America, says all of Western political thought has got it wrong and I have figured it out. It is one of the great eureka moments um, in modern political theory. Uh, he says, in fact, the opposite is the case. Now, and to be fair, he has read David Hume, who has, who has helped uh, lay some of the foundation for this line of thought. Uh, but he says, a big republic, a republic of multiple interests, where the interests are constant re realigning and where no one interest can dominate, that is a much greater uh, check on corruption and tyranny and factionalism than the small republic. Uh, I like to think of Madison's vision of politics as a kaleidoscope. You know, it's like the kaleidoscope changes and the alignments change, and therefore you can't have permanent fixed alignments where, where a permanent fixed majority will permanently oppress 
a single minority. You know, one day, uh, you know, coming from New York, I, you know, New York's history is great this way. So one day Italians uh, are, are aligned with Puerto Ricans in the Bronx. Uh, the next day it's Orthodox Jews in Crown Heights who are aligned with uh, Koreans uh, in Queens. And it is in fact New York's diversity uh, and the constantly shifting alliances that mean that no one group permanently runs New York politics. Uh, so the more multicultural, the more diverse, the more economically complicated your society, the less likely you will be succumb to this problem of faction. Uh, uh, in, in fact, faction will be channeled in a way that makes it uh, artificially produce a better outcome uh, than you could hope for unless you had the perfect philosopher, king, the perfect virtuous leader uh, to rule over you.